Uh, inside the TA Hall at Highton, Donald Wilgus on the right, the returning officer, and the mayor watching over 60 counters who are already hard at work here on the first sort out of the voting slips. Ballot boxes are arriving all the time. The constituency here has grown by 20,000 since the last election, so no one quite knows when it'll all be over, but we expect round about 1 a.m. or just after. And then, of course, the Prime Minister will be down here to hear the result. This is David Dimbleby at Highton. <coughs> And this is Bexley, Ted Heath's electorate, where he's, if the poll shows such a big lead for Labour against him, you would never know to look at Ted Heath here today. He's been touring his electorate, and uh, party morale here, we're told, remains indestructible. Uh, it's a complicated election, though, this for Mr Heath in his own seat. In fact, it could be marginal under certain conditions. He has a majority of only 2,000 in this seat, and you'll see two Mr. Heaths on the board here. That's one of the complications. In fact, this is earlier on, if not today, proved a serious worry to the Tory party agent here. That is the second Mr. Heath we're looking at, who changed his name. You may remember this story in the news earlier. And the official Conservative Party has uh, felt the need to bring out posters like this, which we've been seeing in the streets of Bexley here today, telling the electors to beware of imposters. Now, that's one of the complications, that uh, if people aren't, uh, aren't wary as they go into the polling booths, there may have been a seepage of votes away to this other Mr Heath. Another thing is that there's another independent uh, candidate here running on uh, the immigration and common market issues, both of which, of course, are issues aimed at Mr Heath himself. So with a majority of only 2,000 and needing only a 2.2 national swing to go against him, this could be close here at Bexley. The essence of tonight's story will be told on the state of the party's board. By tomorrow, this board will show the composition of the new House of Commons. To be sure of a bare majority over all other parties, the winning party must get 316 seats of the 630 at stake. As the results come in, we'll be especially watching the top right-hand corner of the board, gains and losses. This is the real battleground. To knock out Labour's overall majority, the Tories must inflict on them 33 net losses. And to secure an overall majority for themselves, the Tories must make 53 net gains. Well, now, let's take a look at what the opinion polls had, say, had to say finally about the prospects as they saw them. Frankly, they were all over the place, and quite possibly one or two may be on the chopping block by tomorrow. ORC in the Evening Standard tonight was giving a 1% Conservative lead, pointing to a probable majority for the Conservatives over Labour of 20 points. At the other extreme, yesterday, Mar Plan in the... Uh, Times was pointing to a 9% Labour lead, pointing to far better than 125, nearer 150 lead for Labour over the Conservatives. Now, the only sensible thing to do in this rather curious situation is to point to the average. Averaging all these up, you get 4.3% Labour lead as the considered judgment of five opinion polls. Now, Labour won last time with 7.3. They're pointing now to a 4.3. In other words, the Tories have chopped back the lead that Labour had in 1966 by three points. Converted into a swing, it looks this way. Here we had the position at the end of the last election, Labour with 111 majority over the Conservatives. Now the opinion polls on average are saying a 1.5% Tory swing. They've cut back Labour a bit since 66, pointing again to a 70%, 70 seat lead for, for Labour over the Conservatives. But what Ted Heath needed to get was a 3.3% swing to knock out Labour's majority, or a 4.3% swing to give the Conservatives an overall majority. That's what he will be watching. Can he do it, in spite of what the opinion polls have said, in the battle that begins in a few moments' time? The opinion polls are on the, on the chopping block. If they go well, wildly out, equally, every expectation will be foiled if the Tories can do what's required to get that position. Cliff. In the next few minutes, we'll be watching Salford West, which aims to declare at about six minutes past 11, and Cheltenham at about 10 minutes past 11, so a race is on there. We'll keep our eye on that for you and go there immediately. It happens. The polls that Robert McKenzie has been talking about may be right or wrong, but they're always based on how people say they intend to vote. They may use their vote and they may change their minds. Now we're going to try something entirely new. We're going to try and predict the first result by a new and admittedly untried method. Nicholas Harmon. What all the other polls have been doing is asking people how they were going to vote. What we've been doing all today 
is asking people how they had voted after they'd voted. The people we asked were the electors of Gravesend. We've chosen Gravesend on the Thames estuary because it's been shown by a computer at Nuffield College, Oxford, scientifically, to be the most ordinary constituency in England. And election night is the night when the most ordinary constituency in England is likely to speak with the true voice of the nation. Gravesend constituency is typical in every way. It's got typical housing, typical cars and typical traffic jams. It's got typical shops with typical prices. People of Gravesend are in the right proportions too, just about the normal numbers of commuters, young voters, immigrants, housewives, pensioners, perhaps even politicians. Gravesend's apparently got just the right number of fields and of people who work in them. It's got big industry along the Thames, just the right amount, says the computer. And Gravesend's 80,000 odd typical electors usually do vote the way Britain votes. They went conservative in the Tory 50s, Labour by a whisker in 64, Labour more generously in 66. If you know how Gravesend votes, you know how the nation votes. We've been trying to find out. We're doing a survey just to find out what the country might vote. We found out in years that the way this constituency goes, the country normally goes that way. Mm -hmm. Do you mind just putting... And now the first result, the result of our own poll at Gravesend as the polls closed at 10 p.m. Result, Conservatives in the lead. Conservatives, 46.4%, Labour, 45.4%. That's Labour 1% below. The Liberals, 8.2%. That's just roughly a tiny bit worse than they did last time. Um, if repeated all over the country, that would mean a swing of 4.4% to the Conservatives, giving them a small but decisive majority in the next House of Commons. Now, it is worth noticing that 24% um, of the people we asked at Gravesend believe in the secrecy of the ballot. They refuse to answer our market researchers' questions. But still, the Gravesend experiment could give us a first indication of what the result might be of the general election 1970. Back to Cliff. Well, uh, not back to me really, but to David Butler, I wonder well, what you make of those figures. Well, certainly, if Gravesend was a tie, the country would be an absolute dead heat between the parties. On this, the Conservatives would get... 318 seats, just over the amount needed to give them a clear majority in the House of Commons. However, a 24% refusal rate would make one rather suspicious of most polls, and I wouldn't rest too much on it. And of course, this poll is subject to sampling error, just like the polls that Bob McKenzie was talking about, and therefore one mustn't read too much into it. However, if we take the result in Gravesend as typical, we're in for an extremely exciting and tense night with no clear indication of a clear majority. I'm looking eagerly for the real votes that have come, and we've had the first bit of hard news about that from one constituency where the turnout was down 6% from last time, which would indicate, uh, which would perhaps be good news for the Conservatives, perhaps a mere reflection <coughs> of a June holiday period. Good. Let's uh, see what's going up on up at Salford West. Let's go up to the decoration area there to Salford West and to Harold Williamson. Well, it looks, it looks as if uh, Salford West is going to beat all records this year because they're expecting to uh, declare at five past 11 now. At least I said five past 11 to the mayor and he said four minutes past 11 because here it's seconds that count. They had a secret weapon here, included among the people counting behind me, they involved a lot of children. They took 60 school children from the grammar schools here and perhaps it's their nimble fingers above everything else that's produced this quick return. But it is a small town, it's 150,000 and it's very compact so there's not very far for the boxes, for the boxes to come. So we'll expect a result now in, uh, by my watch, three minutes. Harold Williamson, Salford West. We won't lose sight of you, Harold Williamson, I may say, and we'll now catch a glimpse of James Burke, who was sitting in unfamiliar uh, surroundings down at Cheltenham. Uh, James Burke, how quickly is Cheltenham going to declare down there? Well, Cheltenham reckon that they're going to get it out first like they've done in the last two elections. The first ballot box came through the door here to the town hall about five past ten, and it's pretty well close to finishing now. They're expecting a very heavy poll, but because the constituency is very compact and the furthest polling booths are only three miles away, the returning officer told me that he reckons that Cheltenham's going to come up with an answer at ten minutes past eleven. James Burke, Cheltenham.
Well, there's one other, as it were, horse in this race, and that's down at Guildford, where Dennis Tui is. Dennis, how are they getting on down at Guildford? It's very close here also, Cliff, at Guildford. The information that we have is that it should be by about five past 11. It's really neck and neck with the other two. Uh, they've, uh, they've been going pretty fast. They've got a streamlined system. They say that although this is uh, not as compact a constituency as the others, the counting system is the best in the land. They reckon that they can do it in a few more minutes. Well, there are three places that we're going to keep our eye on. There is one other place, of course, that we've also got our cameras out, and that is in Wolverhampton. There are two constituencies in Wolverhampton, northeast and southwest. I think most people's uh, fascination will be uh, particularly on southwest. Now let's go. Let's go now to Wolverhampton and to Keith Kyle. They are counting for both constituencies in this civic hall where there was all in wrestling two nights ago. On my left, they are counting for the southwest seat where Mr. Enoch Powell is defending his majority against five competitors for the anti Powell vote. Though one tried to withdraw last night, his name's still on the ballot. And on my right, they're counting uh, in the northeast constituency where the sitting member is the Labour member, Mrs. Renee Short. Here, her Conservative opponent fighting her for the second time is poor Mr. Wright, and he says a vote for Wright is a vote for Powell. Because there are six candidates in South West, it seems likely that North East will run, win the race for the winning count here in Wolverhampton. We are expecting a result in the North East division about 11.15 and in the South West probably about 11.30. Keith Kyle, Wolverhampton. Well, it really is warming up, this, uh, because we're now keeping our eye on about uh, four places all at the same time, unless we've only got it, two eyes. That, that's a bit difficult. Let's go to Salford West now, the taste of honey country. How are you doing up there in Salford? Well, we're still, we're still chasing the clock here. The mayor still feels confident that it'll, it'll all happen in uh, two or three minutes from now. But I've been having a look around myself, and uh, I have my doubts. I think it'll take a li little while longer. Than, uh, than they feel here. But uh, they're, they're very ambitious in Salford. They like to get things done quickly and they're trying their best. Um, we'll let you know as, as soon as, as, soon as uh, we can who is right. Harold Willie for Salford. Thank you, Harold. Stanley uh, Orme is the Labour member there at the moment, uh, I may say. Uh, I've got a piece of paper here which, which says that reports indicate that generally there's been a very heavy poll, especially during this evening. Uh, well, I'm always sceptical about these very we always heavy get poll them. stories. <laughs> Because nobody really, unless they've actually got detailed figures, can know the difference between 72% or 75% of people passing the doors of the polls. We've had two reports in now from individual constituencies. Turnout supposedly down 6% in Guildford, down 3% in Wolverhampton North East. Ah. And these are the two figures we've so far got uh, down the lines. So, but I think one ought to explain the, the effect of turnout, really, on the electorate, on the electorate and how people vote, really. Well, the trouble about that we don't know about what causes a drop in turnout. The register is a little older than it was last time, so there might be rather fewer people able to vote. A few more people have died since the register was compiled in a June election compared to a March election. And also, there are people away on holiday. But there's also the assumption that many people have that apathy hurts the Labour Party. People, it's more likely that Labour Party supporters stay away than that Conservative Party supporters stay away. <coughs> the evidence on this is somewhat mixed, but the polls before the election were showing Conservatives were more determined to vote. And so it's supposed drops in turnout do help the Conservatives, or maybe thought to. However, the reports we've had have been from, relatively speaking, safe seats. And I think that we may find that the turnout holds up, as it did in 1966, in the marginal seats, but not in the safe ones. Well, I think that uh, Guildford might well be winning this uh, race at the moment. Let's go down to Dennis Tui. How are they doing down there, Dennis? I, I don't know whether we're winning or not, but the latest news, Cliff, is uh, four minutes. I got that just about a minute ago, so that should be three minutes. Three minutes to go to the Guildford result. Three, three minutes to go down there. Uh, what are the indications about the poll down there, Dennis? The, indication, the poll indication here is 72%, which is uh, roughly what was expected, uh, neither remarkably large nor remarkably small, so, they, so they, they say here. This is out of an electorate of 68,000, up uh, from 61,000 odd in 1966. 72% poll, uh, that is to say 49,000 votes.